All right. Good morning. Thanks, Dr. Herring, for that introduction, and welcome to everyone. And howdy, everybody. I'm Kai Poehler from Texas A&M, and unfortunately, unfortunately, I'm the moderator here for the first section. So if you're just joining us online, welcome. Um, and for everybody that's here in the room, um, Rebecca and John from Texas A&M AgriLife, everybody wave back there. Uh, John just fixed that problem, so uh, we will no longer have feedback today. So we thank, thank them for their support in this meeting. So before I, I introduce uh, our first speaker, I just want to give a little overview of what we have planned for today, because if you've noticed the, uh, the agenda and the schedule is not, um, if you've been to one of these meetings in the past, is not the same as it normally is. So we decided to try to do something a little bit different to try to, you know, um, get more discussion in, in the groups and, and get more uh, points discussed. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have this joint session uh, this morning. After that, we'll have a panel and then we will separate into uh, two groups and there'll be concurrent sessions that are running. And then um, we'll rotate those, you know, um, basically in the afternoon. You can see that on the schedule. So the idea is that the groups will be smaller. Um, there'll be, um, for example, Dr. Mario Benelli and I are going to do a, a section on estrus synchronization. It's going to be a lot of discussion back and forth in regards to uh, different approaches, different ideas, um, questions from the audience, et cetera, and trying to get, you know, points answered that are helpful for uh, both you all as producers and, and you in the industry. So hopefully that works well. We also will be uh, virtually um, streaming it to people internationally that, that are part of it. So we'll be um, handling uh, those type of questions as well. So hopefully it works well. The, uh, the other room is right over here. You're going to walk out, go to the staircase and, and hang a left um, will be where the other, the other section will be running. So with that, um, we will go ahead and, and move into um, the first session here this morning and uh, and Dr. Vitor Mercadante, who is the chair of our Beef Reproductive Task Force right now. Um, Vitor is going to share a little bit with the use of reproductive technologies to improve the herd. And then following his talk, we'll have a producer and industry based panel to discuss um, a little bit about what people are doing and what's been successful. So the idea is that Vitor is going to set the stage here for what we're going to talk about for the next day and a half. So Vitor. Okay. I'll put these over here otherwise. Yeah. It's not a meeting until you have uh, some technical problems, right? But um, thank you, John. Appreciate it, the help of getting f things fixed so we can reach our, our folks uh, around the internet. So the goal of my talk, as Kai mentioned, is kind of set the stage, talk a little bit about some of the reproductive technologies um, and management practices that can improve your herd um, and set the stage so that as we go uh, with the next talks and the next sessions, so we can really go more in depth on some of those technologies and, and, and learn more about it. So, um, <clears throat> it's not working either. Good that I'm the first one, you know, so we're not. All right, there you go. So, um, and my is that if, if we uh, uh, speak today, my guess is that are things that you guys already um, use, you guys already adopted some of those technologies. So, probably I'm going to be kind of preaching to the choir a little bit, but I think that's important, and uh, we'll, we'll discuss why, why I think that's important. Okay. So, most likely from this meeting too, you're probably in the cow-calf business or in the seed stock business. Um, and if, if you think about what's what's really the goal of a cow-calf operation, uh, on a beef cow-calf operation, really it is to produce that calf, right? Um, and, and hopefully not only produce the one calf here per cow, but also get uh, a healthy, heavy calf that has the greatest genetic potential to perform, right? And that greatest genetic potential to perform is probably even more important if you think about seed stock producer and the value that that animal is really adding to the industry. So, um, and if you think about efficiency and you know how can we do things better, uh, I'm originally from Brazil and I, I've been in the U.S. now for 12 years, almost 13 years. And um, and then you probably if you're in the beef industry, you probably heard of Brazil, right? Um, and 
I learned to 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 talk a little bit about it and, and share some of the things about Brazil with people, so that you know you, you guys can get a, a sense of the beef industry in Brazil. But if you look really at efficiency and we compare the U.S. and Brazil, particularly particularly you know the two largest beef producers in the world, uh, and if you look at the number of cattle, uh, U.S. has currently about 95 million head of cattle. Brazil has 232 million head of cattle, right? It's the largest commercial herd in the world. We lose in total number of animals to India, but India doesn't have a, a commercial herd per se. So Brazil is definitely leading that there, um, you know, and, and the U.S. comes in second. Uh, but as, if you look at total pounds of beef produced, the U.S. produces more beef with less than half of the herd that Brazil has. Right, and that's amazing. That's amazing. If you're sitting in this room, you need to really be proud of the work that you guys do, uh, and the efficiency that the U.S. beef industry has reached uh, is just unbelievable. Right, producing more with less. And you know, we hear a lot of bad things about the beef industry in general, um, and we sometimes fail to share some success stories like this. So. I think it's important that you you see this and you talk about it, so that we can really, uh, you know, spread that that word because it's again, it's an amazing job that we've done in, the, in this industry uh, as far as efficiency. Um, right. So, if you look at um, of beef production in the U.S., that orange line is the herd somewhat staying flat, even trending down downwards. So. We're definitely not increasing our herd in the U.S., but we are increasing beef production, right? Carcass weights. Uh, with, and again, that's how we'll be able to produce more with less. And uh, one more time, it's an amazing job that we do in this country. So if you think about efficiency, we're going to talk about reproduction. We are in the ARSBC after all. Um, so you know, how do you define reproductive efficiency? And this is something I've been always talking with students and talking to producers, and I'll, I'll challenge you to define that for your operation. Now, what does that mean on your operation? You know, what is reproductive efficiency? So, you know, it, it might be something like this. Um, you want to optimize pregnancy. You know, I learned that you don't always want to maximize things because you can do that as an, a, an economic cost. So sometimes it doesn't make sense to maximize things, but we definitely want to optimize things. Uh, we want to optimize pregnancy rate as early as possible in the breeding season. They also want to develop heifers that have high fertility. And you want to do all of that at the smallest cost possible, right? And if we can do that, then I think we're achieving reproductive efficiency. Uh, but again, you know, that, that could change a little bit on your operation with your different goals. So uh, I think it's important that we think about that and define that because if we don't, we're not going to achieve it, right? Uh, if we don't define, if we don't write it down, we're not going to achieve it. So it's really important to, to think about it. Now, for me, in my mind, I like to think about it as this little equation, right? What exactly, uh, how can we get that? And there's not the one silver bullet. Everybody loves that. Um, we love to do the one thing that's going to make us achieve reproductive efficiency that just doesn't exist. Uh, it's really a combination, right? It's a sum of factors. Uh, of good management, uh, nutrition and health, selection pressure for fertility, and then taking advantage of some of the reproductive technologies, right? So think about management. You now, what's the number one factor that affects management? You know, if you think about that, it's you, right? It's the manager. We are the number one factor that affects management in the operation. Uh, so as we think about it, as we challenge ourselves to do better, to in, adopt more technology, to improve efficiency, we're going to have a huge effect on, on, on the bottom line. Right? It's a reproductive management uh, meeting, but nutrition and animal health needs to come first. Right? There's no miracle. Uh, there's no magic protocol. There's no magic drug that's going to make a cow uh, become pregnant if she's uh, not in good condition if she's not healthy. It's not the same thing for the bull. So, you know, that needs to come first. And then we do need to add some selection pressure. You know, are we really uh, selecting for animals that become pregnant in our operations, in our region of the world, right? And then once you have done all those things, I think you can really take advantage of the reproductive technologies that are available. Uh, and there are several uh, that can help us achieve reproductive efficiency. 
right? So if you look at reproductive technologies, there's a list there. It's probably not a complete list, but there's several things that have been available uh, for us uh, beef producers um, to, to really help us improve reproductive efficiency. Some things that sometimes don't even think about it as a technology, right? Like having a breeding season, uh, you know, but in, in, as you go down, some of the more things that we associate with technologies like AI and estrosynchronization synchronization and some of the more newer technologies like cloning and transgenic technologies, which we'll hear more about are the last talk uh, from Dr. Alison Van Nienen, who's have really been leading uh, the work on transgenic animals, right? But again, um, several technologies have been available for quite a while. So preaching to the choir, right? Uh, we understand the, the power of those tools uh, and they've been around for a long time. Right, they've been well established. Some of those, they're supported by research, they're field tested. Uh, but are we really? And we know it works, right? We know it works. But are we really taking advantage of all of it? Um, and as an industry, right? And um, I'll, uh, I'll highly recommend if you haven't heard of this and if you have ever read um, the USDA. Every ten years, they release uh, a survey of beef cow calf operations in the country. And if you had never read this, I really recommend uh, taking a look at it because it's it's really a nice insight on where we're going as an industry, uh, what are management practices that people have adopted, and and does a really good job summarizing this. Um, and you know it's available on the USCA website, right? So uh, you can download it. It's, you know it's a very long document, but it's a it's an easy read for sure. So. Uh, I'm going to share some of the, the the technologies and things that I believe are important, and I also show the adoption level based on the USDA survey. Okay, so if you think about selection pressure, um, there's nothing better, I think, for fertility than having a breeding season, right? And more uh, important, having a short breeding season. Okay, because we also want to maximize the number of animals that become pregnant early, and then they'll in the breeding season, and then they'll calve early on the calving season. Okay. So um, you'd be like, man, everybody has a breeding season, right? Um, if, if you really look at the data from that USDA uh, uh, survey, and this is uh, the amount of days, right? So length of the breeding season, so less than 64 and greater than 150 days, and percentage of operations in yellow, and percentage of cows, beef cows in this country, they are exposed to those breeding seasons, right? So we really think about a defined breeding season of 100 days or less, because um, I think if you're going beyond that, you're probably not really taking advantage, full advantage of the management practice. About 73% of the operations and cows uh, in this country, they are on their breeding season. So that's you know, it's pretty good. If you want to be a little bit more uh, selective, if you're going to do uh, you know, 90 days or less, stay on that 75 days, less than half of the cows and in, in operations in this country are exposed to a short, well-defined breeding season, okay? So are we really taking advantage of the technology? So, but more important even, not only having the breeding season, but really maximizing the amount of cows and heifers that become pregnant early so that they'll calve early. You've probably seen this study before, but it's, a, it's quite a classical study out of Dr. Bob Cushman from the USDA that they looked at uh, the effect of calving, the calving um, period for the first time the heifer calved on longevity of, uh, of those heifers, right? So they uh, classify heifers that were, uh, that calved, sorry, that calved within the first 21 days of the calving season, their first calving season ever. So that's the black bars. Heifers that calved in the middle of the, the breeding season. So that's the gray bar. And then heifers that calved later in the breeding season. That's the white bars, right? And then they looked at average winning weight for those heifers, uh, the offspring of those heifers for several years. So there's a nine uh, calving season study. It's a long-term study. And one of the most striking things was that heifers that calved for the first time ever early continued to calve early for their, uh, for their production life. And they weaned heavier calves and it took five calves, so five calving seasons for those late heifers uh, to catch up on weaning weights um, with their offspring, 
right? And that's pounds of calf that we're leaving on the table, right? Just because those heifers calved the first time later, okay? Um, they also look at longevity. So we know how longevity is important, right? We, we're investing on those heifers. So we want to make sure that they stay in the herd longer so they can return uh, our investment. And the solid line are those heifers that calved for the first time early versus the dotted line, those heifers that calved later. And if you look after nine years or nine calving seasons, there's a little over, I'm uh, getting bit by the thing here, um, a little over, 65% uh, or so of those heifers, they still were in the herd. Those early calving heifers were still in the herd after nine calving seasons, right? After nine years, which means that they were still getting pregnant and still weaning a calf. Because if they didn't, they got cold, right? And if you look at those late calving heifers, about half of them had been gone already um, by the nine years, right? So a small decision that can make a big difference. So, if we select heifer early, you know, they, they get pregnant early and then become, uh, they will calve early, right? In the first 30 days of breeding season, uh, we will be selecting for animals that remain longer in the herd and will be winning uh, heavier calves for us, right? So it's, again, a small decision uh, that really only takes some data management, right? Uh, and can have a huge impact on our herd. So, um, if you think about selection pressure again, and you know, we, we look at the equation, you can do fixed time DI, embryo transfer, best management in the world uh, with great nutrition and animal health programs. But if we're really not cooling the open animals, right, we're not selecting for fertility. And that's a big one. So I, I'm in Virginia, and we uh, very often have a fall and a spring breeding season, right? So producers will have two breeding seasons, two calving seasons a, a year. Which is a, it's a pretty interesting uh, management strategy. But what happens quite often is you get a cow that becomes open in the spring. It's like, ah, oh, man, it's probably my fault. We'll roll her to the fall, right? And then we'll give her another chance in the fall. And then sometimes they become pregnant, un, do not become pregnant in the fall. And it's like, ah, you just roll her back to the spring. And we see that quite often, right? And if we're really not calling those animals because of fertility reasons, we are not selecting for, for fertility, right? So we, we, and so how do we cool open the animals? Right? We need to break check, uh, which is another very important reproductive technology that we have available. So as an industry, how are we doing there? How are we taking advantage of that? Um, that's out of the USCA survey again. So smaller producers, medium-sized producers, and larger producers of 200 head or more, okay? And it's the first year that actually broke it down by technology. So it's pretty interesting to see what people are using for pregnancy diagnose. Uh, palpation, rectal palpation in yellow and doing a blood test in blue and then doing ultrasound in green. And then the red one is like the combined total, right? Um, so, you know, people are using it. What's striking is the larger producers, almost 100% of them are doing it, right? And if you look at the little smaller producers, not so much. Uh, you know, and there's a lot of cows, there's a lot of operations represented on those smaller operations, right? That's the reality of the beef industry for the most part. So, um, you know, about a third of the operations overall taking advantage of um, a pregnancy diagnosis, right? So we can definitely do better. Um, and, you know, we'll get a preg check, but if you don't really write that down, um, that's not, not going to do us very much, uh, very much good. So, we do need to do a better job on data collection and management, right? So there are several ways to collect data. Uh, there's some amazing software nowadays that can really make us, uh, you know, our life easier. But the truth is, you know, if you write it down and you can understand later, that's all you need. Right? We use a lot of Microsoft Excel uh, to manage some of the herds that we work with, and it works fine. Everybody has a computer nowadays, or has a neighbor that has a kid with a computer that can you uh, enter some of that data, right? But most important, right, it needs to be accurate because if you write it down on the IvoMac, uh, you know, piece of cardboard and you throw on the dash of the truck and you never look at it, it doesn't do any good, right? You need to be able to five years, 10 years from now, look back at it and understand that data so that you can make some decisions. So, um, you know, what, what should we collect? And, you know, the sky's the limit, right? Some people collect a lot of data, some people collect less data, uh, but there's, I think some, some of those uh, listed there are the minimum things that we need to make some decisions, but then most more important is what we do with that data, right? So 
uh, are we using that data to make decisions? So are we calculating a 21-day pregnancy rate? We talk a lot about that in the dairy world, not so much in the beef world, right? Um, so how many of your cows are getting pregnant early so that they'll calve early? How many of your heifers are getting pregnant early so they'll calve early and remain longer in the herd and so on? Um, you know, what's your overall pregnancy rate? So if you're doing AI, for example, and then how is your natural service bulls doing? You know, what's your calving rate? What's your weaning rate, right? What's your weaning weights as well? You know, are your cows weaning some pretty heavy calves or not? And what are your total pounds of calf exposed, uh, of calf per cow exposed, right? Because that's really where you're gonna make money. So if we're collecting all that data, but not really making some, some calculations and looking at things, uh, we're not going to be able to really manage those things. And at the end of the day, what we want to do is identify our good cows, right? Well, you want to identify your good cows. And I always tell, tell producers and, and people that I will challenge you to write that down as well. Write that definition down. What a good cow really is for you. And it might be different than that, uh, but, you know, I'll, I'll challenge you to write it down. And then you put on the barn so the cows can see it, right? And then you can hold them accountable, right? If they do not fit that, they need to go. Right, um, and the one thing that we usually do as well, you know, the temperament is important, right? Uh, temperament is important, not only for a safety reason, uh, but also for productive reasons. Um, so, hey, now the cook, uh, when he was in Oregon, now he's a, here at Texas A&M, has done a lot of work on temperament. This is a small study that we did in Flor uh, in Virginia, just looking at classifying heifers based on temperament. Heifers that were calm, heifers that were excitable, okay? And you probably know exactly who those heifers are, right? Who those cows are in your operation. You know who the excitable ones are. And they, they're not only a, a safety risk, but they're also a productive um, you know, drain for our operation. This is pregnancy rate to time the AI uh, between those two groups. I want a 20% difference uh, between those two groups, right? And that doesn't mean they're all like crazy cows that will you know, kill you if they uh, if you walk in the pen. But those are cows that are just too excited that they get constantly moaning as you walk them through the chute, that they hit the head catch as hard as they can, right? So those animals that really just are not comfortable uh, being worked. And as we talk about astro synchronization and some of the technology that we work them more frequently, that definitely has a toll, right? So not only a safety reason, but definitely a production reason as well. Now we talk a lot about the cow and we tend to blame the cow pretty uh, pretty commonly and often we focus on the cow, but the reality it takes two, right? And, and a lot of times we oversee the bull and we, we start looking more at it and, and what are the effects of the sire, uh, effects of semen on, on fertility and so on. And we're gonna have a couple of talks uh, focusing on that, right? So how do we measure fertility on your natural service bulls? You know, we do a BSC, right? Again, I don't even know how old uh, the technology is, but it's, it's been around for a long time and it's fairly cheap, right? It's fairly cheap. Um, so how many people are doing that every year? Doing a Britney Sounds exam on their bulls? If you look at smaller operations, large operations, so on and so on. Again, the larger operations really take advantage of the, the technology. But if you look at the smaller producer, not so much. And the one thing that has always amazes me is how many bulls those guys have, right? Might have one, maybe two. They only have one bull and the bull did not pass the BSC that year. It's a bad year, right? That's a bad year. So we need to make sure that we're identifying, catching those as early as possible. But again, what's the opportunity as an industry uh, to improve on that? Um, and then we think about, um, we're going to hear a lot about AI and astro synchronization. That's kind of how this group uh, was formed. It was around some of those protocols, right? Um, and we all understand the benefits of AI. Right? It's the ability to really buy the best genetics that are available for a, a fraction of the cost. So I'm from Brazil, right? And this is the type of cattle that we have down there. Uh, kind of crazy. They'll catch you, but they're really well adapted. They do well on that environment. Uh, so some Nelori cows. But Late puberty, not the best carcass quality traits, right? So what's happening in Brazil is we're coming here in Kansas and Nebraska and Virginia and, and buying semen from Angus bulls that if we were to buy that bull and send him down there to Brazil, he'll probably die, right? He's not gonna breed any cows. But we can buy his semen uh, and breed. And this is a true F1 Nelori Angus calf in Brazil. It's a calf that's becoming more and more popular. It has a big value and you get a premium if you can sell that calf, 
right? And we can only get that done with AI. We can only get that done with AI for the most part in Brazil, right? So again, benefits of AI are just amazing. And then as you think about how can we optimize labor and, and do a better job and AI some larger uh, type operations, astro-synchronization just you know, it, it made that possible, right? So we can control the astro cycle uh, to make sure that we AI uh, the you know, as many cows as possible in the short period of time, right? And, and more importantly, getting more cows pregnant in the shorter period of time. So um, another study has become quite classic that co uh, compares two systems, one that uses a natural service breeding for nine days um, versus a system that does one synchronization and AI, and then does a cleanup bull of natural service systems, uh, natural service sires uh, for 90 days, okay? So mainly comparing the effect of the synchronization uh, on, on calving distribution. So if you look at calving distribution, about 44% of the cows that were exposed to timed AI calved within the first 20 days, which means that they become pregnant in the first 20 days of the breeding season, versus 25% on the uh, natural service. Like, okay, what's the big deal? Well, if you look at really at uh, total pounds of capped wean per cow exposed, there's a 17 kilos or 38 pound difference uh, between those two groups per cow exposed, right? So that's money. And on, on that study, it's about a $50 profit gain for uh, per cow exposed on, on the system that use fixed time AI, right? So we know it works and we know it pays off. It's, are people uh, using that? So this is adoption of AI and SO synchronization in the US, smaller producers to larger producers and, and so on. Um, and just like most technologies, the larger producers take more advantage of the technology compared to the smaller producers. But overall, um, as an industry, we're still pretty, pretty low. Where were 10 years ago? Um, the 2008 survey, um, so we've, we've done some improvements, right? We've done some improvements. Um, and if you look just at the overall, it's a little bit misleading, but if you look at the larger producers, we have definitely uh, taken up uh, the use of the technology, right? Have definitely taken up. So um, maybe everybody sitting here is doing, is doing a pretty good job of spreading the world. So, there are other technologies on that survey as well uh, that they look at the adoption and uh, some things like embryo transfer um, that we see more often and more commonly being used on the uh, seed stock producers. Um, but if you if you look at compared the beef with the dairy, we're behind on everything, right? We're behind on everything for sure. Um, and again, about 37% or so of the producers that use at least one of the above technologies. So. We, we do a lot of thinking about that. You know, why are not people adopting some of those technologies if we know that they work, if we have data showing that they work? And, um, you know, again, right, it works, we know it. So why are people not using it? Or not as many people using? So I um, started doing a lot of thinking on this and um, I was talking to Pedro Fontes of Georgia, he's gonna be talking later and, um, you know, how can we, change this. So I came across this theory, it was called the diffusion of innovation, right? And this is what companies like Apple and, you know, Android that they use when they're going to introduce new technology, right? So it takes a little while. So there's about 10% of the population that will adopt something right away because they're excited about technology. They, you know, they just want to be in the upfront uh, of, of things, right? And this is true in every, every you think about beef industry as well. And then we'll have some of the, we'll call the visionaries, which is, you know, some of those other people that, okay, we'll take it up uh, within, you release something today, within the two, three years from now, they were like, okay, we're gonna try the technology, right? Um, but it's kind of a, uh, you know, it takes a while to go up that curve. And then there's a tipping point, which is about a third of the population. Once you can get about a third of the population using something, um, then it kind of, you know, it, it takes off and then people kind of creates critical mass and then more and more people start using. So as you look at some of that data from the USDA uh, survey, you know, we're right there with estro synchronization, for example, we're right at that 30% uh, point, right? So it's been a 10, 15 year climb to get people to use it. And some of those early adopters, people really 
love the technology, but um, we're, I think we're almost there. We're almost there. The tipping point that you can get more people using the technology, right? So I need you to become excited about reproductive technologies, right? And you, again, if you're sitting here and probably preaching to the choir, you do some of those things, already use those. But you talk about it with your neighbor, you know? Do you go in a church and then you talk about it? Uh, hey, man, I'm AI, my cows, and it's working great. I'm doing this protocol. And I think that's what we need a little bit more is for everybody to become an advocate and, and, and really talk about the technology, um, you know, that repro rocks. And, and you know, it's, a, that it's pretty cool and it works, right? And it pays off. So I really think we're at that point now to be really be able to create some, uh, some, some critical mass around these technologies and, and make things work. Right. And I'll, I'll bring it back to that one of those first figures, right? Where we're going. And we're already doing amazing. We're already doing an amazing job as an industry. So imagine where we could be um, if we get more people doing some of those technologies, right? You know, where does that curve go and where does it stop? And it really excites me uh, to think about that, right? Where, where are we going with genomics now? The ability of you know, becoming cheaper and cheaper to really test your cows and get EPD in your cows. And, you know, okay, we're going to be use that as an information to then do more selective breeding. Uh, and there's just, the opportunities are amazing. So again, um, yeah, so I really hope that after this week and today and tomorrow, as you hear things and you get excited about some of the technologies, you go out of here and you tell people about the task force and you tell people about uh, some of our, the resources that we have on our website, some of the technologies that we're sharing so that we can reach more people, get more people excited. Uh, and hopefully we can really tip, tip over and uh, go over that tipping point and get more and more people using those technologies. Okay. Um, so that's what I have. And um, I really want to thank everybody again. Um, our Beef Reproduction Test Force uh, website, we're on Facebook, we have a YouTube channel. A lot of our talks get uploaded there for free. There's some amazing talks uh, already available uh, on our website and on our YouTube channel. If you do Twitter, there's Twitter as well. We try to post things about, about cattle. Um, so I hope that you can follow us and we can st uh, stay connected. And I'm really looking forward to the next couple of days. And um, I think we'll have time for some questions. Thank you. So we have time for some questions for Dr. Mercadante. Someone has to ask him a question. Questions, questions. So I'll start with one, you know, Vitor, one of the things I think is if you look at all the economic models that we generate and look at, you know, the, the effectiveness of AI, talk about pregnancy being five times more profitable than our measure or impactful than any other trait we measure. So all the economic models suggest, you know, positive effects of, of reproductive technology, yet we struggle to adopt it. And you talked about some of those strategies. So if we have these strong economic models, how do we prove other successes in getting those things to happen? Um, yeah, I, I think the, uh, the, the economics, uh, for the most part, they will, they will work. And we have tools nowadays that can help us uh, help even simulate those technologies, the use of those technologies. Um, what I think it's also important is that it varies a lot, right? So, so people within different operations, within different areas, uh, you know, the cost and the labor and, and so on, it changes quite a bit. So um, I, think, I think it's important to consider that um, as, as we make decisions and, and really, again, collect data, look at your own operation. Does it really pay off or not? And, and we believe it does for the most part, um, but, but I think it's important that people do, do, their, do their own homework and, and figure that out. Um, you know, the one thing that we see a lot of times is uh, they'll, they'll try something new and it doesn't quite work and then they'll quit. And that's very off, off kind of happens often with time they eye. They, they try time they after the first time they have a, well, they hear that it's about 60% pregnancy rates usually, and they got a 40% that year and they go like, never again, you know, never again, I'm doing this. And, uh, and, and the reality is that we know it's kind of a process. It takes some time to get to those. Uh, better results, and it takes some time to get your cows used to and your facilities, uh, you know, in order so that you can do a better job working cattle more more often and so on. Um, so um, it's it's kind of a long term 
long-term process too. Um, it's a, it's an, definitely an investment that you sometimes you don't see it right away um, the return. But yes, sir. Talk about uh, doing a good job of more efficient in meat production, and one of the buzzwords in the future of our industry, I think, is the carbon footprint. So. Uh, as an answer to that, having a higher harvest weight than slaughter, and if so, what are the answers to doing that? So, for for those online, um, the question is about you know the carbon footprint, and uh, if, if talk about efficiency, and uh, is is the answer to having a lower carbon footprint to have higher carcass uh, weights? And I, I think the answer for the lower carbon footprint is really a whole system approach, right? It's not going to be the one thing that's going to fix it. Um, so can we get more cows pregnant and can we in increase our stocking rates and, you know, can then can we transport cattle more efficiently and then can we finish cattle more efficiently? So um, as, as we think about the carbon footprint and that's another area that we get just slaughter, right? As an industry, uh, we have the worst uh, image ever, which is not really a true image. Um, so. Uh, the, the reality is that for, for most of us, we're a carbon sink, I believe. I actually set of a, a big carbon emitter, we're actually a, a sink of carbon. Well, people don't hear about that. But I, I think the answer you know, to focus on what uh, we're doing, our carcass is already pretty heavy, right? Um, you know, can we increase that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, but I think it's more of a whole system approach that we're really going to be able to, to reduce our carbon footprint, which is, again, we're doing. If you look at any university now, there's somebody doing work on uh, nutrition efficiency and greenhouse gas emissions and how can we uh, improve those? Because it's not only a you know, social and environmental concern, but it's also a, a, uh, an aspect where we lose efficiency right? as a finishing cattle. Um, if we can finish cattle emitting less, um, greenhouse gases usually is because we're getting more efficient as well. Uh, so more efficient gains and so on. So I really think it's a it's going to be a combination of factors um, to to really help us achieve that lower carbon footprint. Void. Victoria, the beef industry in the United States, for the most part, particularly that lower end of that state, is more about a lifestyle than anything else. You can't get lost if you don't know where to go. That's part of the issue that has been my outline. That doesn't seem to have changed. Yeah, so the comment, um, it's about, especially if you look at a smaller producer, um, it's more like a lifestyle type producer. And I agree with you. And um, one of the challenges with the beef industry and driving change is how, you know, segment we are. And, um, and, and, and yeah, I agree with you. A lot of our producers are smaller producers and they have, inherited some land and have some cattle on the side and they're not what we'll call maybe like a professional cattleman right somebody that that's their first source of income and then and yeah it's a little bit harder to to drive change are we going to ever get to the point of the dairy industry where the small guy disappeared i don't know i think if it's we're a long ways from there um if we think look at other countries like brazil for example um, it's harder to survive as a smaller producer. So there's been a lot of, uh, you know, growth and uh, people, uh, some of those, you know, mostly family-owned operations, just like here, but just getting bigger and bigger uh, because there are, there's a lot of power on uh, economy of scales, right? So how are we going to do that in, in this country? I think as, as things change and there's maybe some environmental pressures and, and new uh, laws, um, that might have an impact on that small producer that might be like, you know, I don't wanna, wanna deal with all the trouble. Um, and, and maybe we're going that way, uh, but I think it's gonna take a long time, Boyd, uh, to, really, to really do that. And I hope it doesn't happen, right, too. Um, I think it's important to have some of those smaller producers who a lot of times kind of oversee that. It's, it's a little bit more of a, how can we adopt so that we can offer that service, right? So they don't have a, um, a working facility. You know, I worked with uh, Christina, Dr. Christina Porter, that's getting the award today. And the first time I went out there to South Dakota, we got to the pasture and it's like, where are the working facilities? Oh, it's coming, right? They bring it over and they build it right there in 15 minutes. They set up 
portable corrals and we AI 100 cows and then we turn them out, right? So how can we as an industry adapt to offer a service to those smaller producers and, and make things work, right? Jason, let me leapfrog up that question. So flashlight cows. Sure. Uh, if you've got a record of two management strategies or technologies, easily adopted for their first year, what are the two things you're going to ask them Sure. Uh, the question is about what are the two technologies that I would tell somebody um, that is maybe a smaller, smaller producer or not that wants to get their feet wet, I guess. Um, so the first thing that I would say is uh, making sure that you do have a, a breeding season that is short and is defined. Um, and then two will be data collection which we often oversee, and it doesn't take much to do. Uh, and just by looking at your cows and understanding things better, we can then make some decisions uh, we, of which technology next year we can adopt, right? So things like collect body condition score on your cows. Nobody has, a, not everybody has a, body, a, a scale, right? But everybody can do body condition. And I always tell people, you know, collect body condition every month for a year on your cows. Um, stampede, right? Um, but, you know, and if we do that, we can have a better idea of when your cows are losing weight, when your cows are gaining weight. So when do you need to really intervene, right? Um, and, and that there's a lot of power on that alone. So I would say have a, a breeding season uh, and then start collecting some data and then test your bulls. Make sure you're using natural service. That'll be a third one for sure. Yep. Go find a mic, Joe. We'll, we'll bring a mic to you. Hold on, hold on. That's them drilling the hole under the floor here to take Vitor away. So it just give it a few minutes and he's going to go by. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the the idea of uh, more pounds of beef carcass is is an interesting one, and I just want to jump in here. There are scientists that are looking at this. Um, how high can we go? But also what it does to the carcass relative to cutability and to value of the carcass. That's ongoing research. I know a faculty member in my own department who's looking at that, but also around the U.S. because when the carcasses get too big. They, they essentially change and the cutability changes. So that may be an answer to a point, but we might go off the edge there too if we add too much weight to them. They gotta fit the box. They gotta hang on the rail and they gotta fit the box. Also just add in regards to carbon emissions and, and methane and everything associated with that. I think it was just came out from FAO or one of the major organizations in the last 10 days that actually North America has the lowest amount of emissions in regards to any of the other continents, which is, you know, if we look at it from an agriculture point of view, I think is a good story to tell there. Um, and we can all agree or disagree what those numbers might mean, but I think it's good for at least our industry to, to see where North America ranks. And at least we're not in the bottom to start with to try to you make, make progress with that. Other questions or comments for Vitor this morning? Yes. You know, Vitor, just a follow up. The question about the small producers. We talk a lot about ethnic synchronization to be used with AI or ET, but uh, just talk what's a simple protocol for ethnic synchronization for natural service? If you know, maybe some of those cows if they aren't pregnant or they see them in natural service. Sure. The question is about. Uh, synchronization protocols um, to be used with natural service. And you know, we had some quick discussions last night about we, we, one of the things that we do, right, is put out the, the list of protocols that are being approved. And the reality is any protocol can be used with natural service, right? But as, as you look at the more complex or the more intense type protocols that cost more money and takes more time, like why would you use natural service on those, right? And, and not take full advantage of the technology and then use some uh, uh, better sires that can improve the genetics even more. Um, if you, one thing that we to people, if they want to start doing AI and um, perhaps they want to start doing some synchronization, 
Um, any of the protocols on the list that are used for uh, estrus detection can also be used for natural service, okay? Specifically, the, some there's like the select sync, which I, you know, I'm not gonna remember on top of my head right now, but, you know, two shots of prostaglandin, 10 days apart, for example, right? It's a great way to get cows start cycling um, and get more cows cycling together so that the bulls can breed them earlier. Um, but the reality is uh, any of the protocols with estrus detection uh, can be used successfully with natural service bulls, right? Uh, but then it goes back to, to that point. We're going to have more cow cycling early in a, in a period, shorter period of time. So are your bulls ready to breed more cows in a shorter period of time, right? So watch, uh, making sure that bulls have passed the BSC, that they're in good condition, they're ready to go breed cows is also important uh, because, yeah, we give some injections to cows and then we don't test your bulls. Uh, you're, you know, not again, not taking full advantage of the, the, the technologies. So along those same points, comment on the idea, you know, I think one of the things is reproductive technology is, is just going to continue to get more complicated in some ways, you know, as we think about the protocols, et cetera. <laughs> the protocols and, and what we're seeing, and then you had genomics, you had all these other things on. So Victor, you know, in the approach that you sort of talked about, how do we deal with this continued additive complexity while trying to still get people to adopt on the bottom ends, yet at the very high end, we have people that are using genomics, using IVF, using cloning, using all these different technologies, and we're trying to balance sort of hitting that target of getting people still to adopt, getting those people, like you said, Don, to, to you know, get in the game type, type of deal but not lose focus and sort of catering to our top end clients. To me, it's almost like teaching a group of undergraduate students. You, you got the bell-shaped curve, right? You got the students that really want to make an A, you got the students that really don't care, and the majority are just there because they want to get through. And so how do we how do we balance that with our producers? And, and so if you can comment on that in any way, that'd be great. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it, I think there's a, a couple of things that we as a group been trying to do is like one, keeping things simple, right? And, and have a, a kind of a menu almost of, of um, synchronization protocols, for example, that go from the most intrinsic to the less complicated and cheaper as well uh, compared to some of the others. Uh, and, and I think that's important as a group because yeah, we're, again, if you're sitting here today, we're preaching to the choir, you probably do synchronization, you've been doing a good job and uh, you're interested in learning. Um, but some of the producers that don't, um, and they need something more simple, right? And the, the, the beauty of it is those technologies have been around for a long time. And we do have those things that are more simple and, and are proven to work. And um, so, so we have that uh, spread that we can serve both both ends of uh, of that curve. So, but again, I think I think we uh, we as an industry sometimes do a poor job of sharing and and talking and and hearing each other sometimes and, and sharing some success stories and getting people excited about about some of those technologies. Um, you know, you, you buy a new phone and you you talk about it on on your you know breakfast with friends it's like, hey i just got a new phone it's nice and like how many of you go hey man i just tried this new protocol and it's really awesome uh right uh but but there might be an opportunity to really do more of that um and and, and i hope we do i hope we do okay let's thank b one more time for that opening talk Okay, so now, you know, the, the real situation is as academicians, we all know that you guys only take about 25% of what we say to real truth. So now we're going to have the people that are really out in the field um, and the ones that are boots on the ground really come up and, and share a little bit about what the, the true story is and what's happening. So um, I've been, we, we, we had a producer panel. Um, and we've only had one successful producer make it because of either COVID or uh, getting hurt by a cow. So have Lauren Lissy that's going to come up. You gotta you gotta bring a chair with you when you come. So it's it's uh, BYOC here, and um, and then I'm going to have representatives from some of the AI companies. So Nikki Ustazen from ABS. So Nikki, if you'll come up, uh, Dan Bush from Select Sires, uh, Matt Rents from GenX. 
um, Luke Bradford from ST. So if y'all come up, you can grab one of these chairs here in the front and we'll get positioned here on the stage and then we'll get started. One second. Okay, I'm not exactly sure where I need to stand with this mic, but we'll we'll try um, this. So, um, so basically, what I want to do is I'm going to go through this group and and have them share a little bit about who they are, what they do, um, and then we'll come back around and talk about successes and and challenges that we see. But you know, really, is to focus on kind of what Vitor talked about from the big picture point of view um, and the way that. I would say a lot of us see it from an academician out in the field type situation, but now really here, the successes and maybe in some cases the failures that we see out in the field and, and some of the, the challenges with technology adoption, but also what has worked really well. And, and the thing that I always say is, you know, technology adoption is not a one size fits all. It's not why we all don't have an Apple phone and an Apple watch. It's why some of us have Androids, et cetera, right? Because we don't all fit that same box. And I think that that's really the important thing with reproductive technology. It, it's not a, you need to use this protocol versus this protocol. You need to do this or you need to do that. It's use some type of technology to advance the goals of your herd and however that might be. Right? And so that's really what we want to focus on. So Lauren, if you go ahead and introduce yourself, talk a little bit about you guys' ranch and, and what your goals are, and then we'll circle back around for some of the reproductive technologies. So uh, my name is Lauren Lissy, uh, owner slash operator slash <laughs> everything at Lissy Beefmasters. Uh, our family's been in the business for 50 years since 1972. I'll be the third generation and my kids will soon be the fourth. Um, we've adopted and started using reproductive technologies uh, 2007 and been using them ever since then. Um, our goal there is to produce a high quality seed stock product that can go compete in the show ring, but also go out there and work for the commercial producers and put a high quality carcass um, on the ground and do it all in one animal, but it's a lot harder than it looks. A little bit about where you guys are located here. Uh, we're located um, in Stockdale, Stockdale, Texas, which is about 35 miles from here. Um, everybody grew up here in San Antonio, the family, and so we're kind of based right here in the heart of San Antonio. All right, thanks. Yeah, and, and Lauren's uh, family has is, is, uh, been big supporters of our beef, beef master herd at Texas A&M, and so we've done a lot of work with their cattle, and, and he'll share a little bit about some of the technology that they're using. So, Luke? There we go. Uh, my name is Luke Bradford. I work for ST Genetics, so one of the semen companies. I'm originally from Northeast Texas and currently live uh, just east of College Station, so pretty close to our global headquarters. But I'm one of several regional managers for ST Genetics on the beef side, so I cover six states and I work with uh, field reps within my territory, um, semen sales and helping with uh, helping producers with their uh, reproductive work, AI, synchronization, things like that. Um, obviously, ST, we're known for our sex semen, so I do a lot of work with sex semen, uh, both boss taurus and boss uh influence cattle. And so a lot of what I do is revolved around, you know, finding out what protocols, what uh, management practices work best to maximize that technology. And so um, the region that I oversee, like I said, it's six states. It's probably the most diverse uh, region in the company. I've got everything from desert to swamp in my region, so a wide wide range of environments and breeds of cattle, which make it really interesting. Um, but our region, um, our annual sales would be almost 50-50 sex and conventional semen, so pretty exciting technology. It's getting more and more ado adoption in the commercial se sector as well as the, the purebred sector, and so that's a lot of what I'm doing and working with, so. All right. Is that good? Excellent. 
Dan Bush from Select Sires. Dan's always nervous when I introduce him somewhere because you know we overlapped almost. Well, we overlapped in Missouri for quite a bit, but uh, I won't say anything bad about you today, Dan. So. All right, I appreciate that. I can tell a few stories about Kai if you want to hear them as well. But so Dan Bush with Select Sires, um, you know, went to University of Missouri at that time, did a master's there, was involved with extension research side of things. Um, then a bit of a select for about 13 years now. Um, I worked in direct sales in Missouri, working with producers, you know, during breeding seasons, working on breeding projects, managing those as well, uh, but also serve as the beef reproduction specialist for the U.S. So, you know, during the breeding season, I get the phone calls of, you know, we did this sync protocol, but messed up and gave this shot. What do we do now? Or, you know, the other phone calls of. We only got 35%. What do we do now? And, and I go back to Vitor's comment of unless you have the records to know what maybe went wrong, it's 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 a lot of troubleshooting. We can throw a lot of ideas out there, but unless we have information, it's really hard to pinpoint areas to improve. So I, I would second his comment of get the records when you can and keep those records. All right, Nikki. Hi everyone, my name is Nikki Westhuizen. I'm originally from South Africa. Uh, I came to the US and I did my master's degree at the University of Florida and then my PhD at Texas A&M. And right now I work for ABS. I'm based out of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I'm a sales manager up there, South Dakota, North Dakota. And I'm also a beef reproduction specialist for our, our beef team. So I'm involved in a lot of the research that goes on to get these protocols approved. I, I'm uh, Matt Reince. I'm, uh, I guess I'm originally from South Dakota. Um, I lived in Nebraska quite a while. And, uh, you know, I was pretty fortunate to, uh, to start out my AI career as a rep. And uh, now I've uh, lucky enough to be a area manager for Gen X. And, uh, you know, I live in Wichita Falls. My, you know, I've got a big area in the south here that I cover. Um, you know, I deal with uh, the reps, um, being the face of the company. Um, you know, we we help with projects. We, uh, you know, you know, kind of been around it all. But it is I'm probably the least qualified as far as a, uh, you know, a, a repro specialist, but maybe a hands-on guy that that I feel like I've done a lot. I guess you know, being in my position, and one thing that the people that are around me a lot they always hear me say this, but, uh, you know, one word I heard, uh, Vitor say this morning was improve. Um, I guess it's one of my life mottos. And so on my refrigerator at home, I look at it every day is, uh, no matter what we do in life, you know, uh, something I always try to say is never stop trying to improve. And I think, uh, this room is, is, a uh, exemplifies that. And it's something that no matter what we're doing in life, there's something that we always want to try to do, I think. So anyway, that's something that AI or any of these technologies can offer, so. Excellent, so I'll start with Lauren. Lauren, when, when you guys think about, you know, to adopt technology, all right? And so you go through it as a, thinking about it from a producer or a business point of view, what are some of the things you think about specifically in regards to reproductive technology, you know, and, and, and maybe expanding a little bit about what type of reproductive technology you guys utilize in your herd um, and, you know, how you might work with, you know, let's say you, you sell a group of females to a client and then, and it's their first time in the cattle business. How do you mentor them to pass off this idea of adopting technology? First thing, um cost effective efficiency um my mom and my wife will tell you that we spend too much money on doing this stuff but dude, looking at it um those females that we use these technologies on have got to be the right correct genetics for where our goals are set out to be so that's where we start and it's usually revolved around cow families. And when clients come to us and buy a set of heifers or some cows, maybe some proven cows that don't fit the mark for us anymore, we try to go back to the base roots of everything. And I've always said that, you know, you're only as good as a solid foundation or the base of the solid foundation you build off of. And for us, it's we wrap that around cow families and we try to select 
on who checks all the boxes. And for our clients of getting them to understand that, it's we go back and we show preg, preg rates history, what the cow's done, what she's been able to re, re, generate and revenue back for us. Um, you can go in our herd and we can find 12, 14 year old cows still in production. Um, and we've have their daughters, their granddaughters, and now some great granddaughters in production for us and mentoring those new clients to understand that it's, we've got to build all this. We've got to continue to focus on who gets the job done every day, necessarily not who's favorite, but who can ger generate that revenue to come back for us. Cause it's, that's what it's all. I've got to make the money to spend the money to progress forward is the way we look at it. Um, but a lot of it is just don't chase the fads that some of these, you know, hot bulls hit the market of a hundred thousand dollar bull or maybe a ten thousand dollar bull from the right ranch. And we've had some clients jump off. We've tried some of it and we've had those failures. And sometimes those are expensive learning curves. But at the same time, they've got to live through that. So some of it is experience, going through the troubles and growing pains. But a lot of it, if we can avoid that, is kind of where we try to troubleshoot that. And we know just try to stay in the middle lane and don't veer too far off the, the beaten path is what I try to tell them. Yeah, and, and so to that a little bit and in, in about the level of technology that you guys are using, you know, I, I know you heard very well. So you're using all the way down from, from natural service all the way up to, you know, cloning, it, for, for example, and, and, you know, how you balance that within your herd, how you make those decisions, obviously the elite genetics, et cetera. But, you know, you, I think you guys have been successful doing it on all different levels um, with your different, different herds that you work with. So we've started where well, we started with AI when I was shoot out of high school in 2007. And then we've slowly got in 2009, 9, 10, 11, we started flushing. We had two cows that we based our herd around that at that time we wanted to buy the flush, the conventional ET and IV, IVF. And those were cows that have, had, I think there were seven, eight year old cows that have proven themselves to us of what they could do and what their daughters could do. So we decided to start flushing them and we went conventional route and then we tried the IVF. Um, and what we did for some of the producers that are just now getting into today, what we did, instead of going out and buying a set of recepts, things like that, we went through our herd and found our bottom 50% of kind of, I would say the less, produ not less productive cows, but the cows that just, try to make them raise a better cat force so we selected those as recepts and we started talking to some breeders what we were doing there and they kind of looked at us like we were crazy but the way we saw it on our side was if we can make if she can raise an et calf out of this prolific donor i've just added that much more value to my herd and then we turned our we went through all that and then we turned our bulls back out on natural service for cleanup so at the end of the day we were not losing any ground we were just gaining ground as the way we looked at it, but faster. So then we speed up to, I guess, I guess now 17 on, we've done AI, conventional ET, we'll do some I, uh, IVF work. And we've probably done more IVF work the last three years, uh, concentrate on more cows or fewer donors, produce more eggs, but we can sex those for females or bulls, whatever that cow or that donor does be better for us. And we've built kind of our herd around two gene pools that of genetics that have meshed together and crossed well together, but also make that a sought after product. And now we've gone out to, we've got our first clones on the ground. We purchased a clone back in 2017, 16, 17, and had some really good success with her sold, marketed, uh, lots of calves out of her. And then we finally produced our first clone, which hit the ground a couple months ago out of a donor that's probably rose to the top. She wasn't no supermodel out there, but when you got her product on the ground, it totally excelled. And we've decided to take advantage of that, recreate her and bring her back after 10 years. And she hope, hopes to replace the original and keep moving that genetic line forward. And we've even working with Texas A&M over there <clears throat> and doing all the reproductive
technologies and advancements can do, we've been able to start the A&M herd out basically where we're at currently today. And I, I think that's where the future's at. We have new clients come to us. Com they may be commercial producers wanting to get in the seed stock business or even seed stock guys, just how do I get to that next level? And my first thing is we go to the embryo tank or we go to the donors, buy some flushes and start out that way because that's our current peak of our success right now. And we're going to start there and move forward. All right, I'll give you a break here for a second, Lauren. So the question I have for the four of you that represent the AI companies, and I didn't tell any of you that this was going to be a question, so this is kind of, you know, one from the outfield. You know, we, it always comes up, you know, um, and, and Dan, you mentioned it, when you have those 35% days or they're even worse than that, um, and, and it really hurts, right? So, you know, how do we how do we push realistic expectations, but how do we balance, like when we get into a herd, it's the first time situation, sort of balancing risk, et cetera, and things that can do that we can do um, to make that producer be as successful as possible. So anybody can address that, um, it's to any of y'all. So Dan, since you have the mic, you go ahead. I'll You've had a lot of 35%, so. <laughs> sure. So, I mean, I think a lot of it is, it's not, you know, this isn't a decision you make a month before breeding season. This isn't a decision you make two months before breeding season. It's it's a yearly process of, you know, like Vitor mentioned, making sure your cows are in the right body condition score, making nutrition and minerals on the right program, making sure you have a defined breeding season to start with, um, and, and, and ensuring, you know, maybe your cow herd is getting, you're getting 90 plus percent of them pregnant in a defined breeding season before you even take the jump to go do a sync program. I mean, there's a lot of things that need to be in place before taking that step to start an AI program. You know, I, yeah, I'd love to go to a new customer and say, okay, year one, we're going to breed every one of your cows and every one of your heifers. But if I know in the back, you know, in the back that this isn't going to work out well, that we've got a lot of other things to tackle before that. It's like, like we said, if somebody tries it and has a failure the first time, the likelihood of them doing it again is very, very minimal. Um, so if you can make that first time a success, and, and like I said, it may not be taking this information you learn here today and going home and starting, you know, this first year, it may be making those gradual improvements over years um, to get to the point where you feel comfortable taking that step, starting a synchronization program, starting an AI program. Anybody else want to address that? Okay. Yeah, just, just to talk about what Dan said, um, you know, especially as you get new new adopters, you know, people that are doing AI for the first time, you know, it's their first year. A lot of times those people are super eager, super excited, and they want to jump in with, you know, both feet. And uh, I think all of us could say, you know, a big part of our job and in, in the reps that we work with is, you know, having people that have the, the confidence and the comfort level with coaching those people through the process and managing expectations is a huge thing. Um, some people aren't uh, comfortable doing that, you know, they just want to go in and do the work and, and, uh, but the person who's, comfortable enough and cares enough to tell people when they see something that is going to negatively affect the AI project or the reproductive efficiency and, and is willing to coach them and kind of hold their hand. Cause I encounter that a lot. Um, people who are AI for the first time, you almost have to save them from themselves and really coach them. Um, and that's, that's going to ensure that you have a history with that customer and it's not just going to be a one and done if they have a train wreck. And really, I think if you can convince them to, before you ever even start, if you can convince them to commit to three or five years and say, hey, you know, this is a project, you know, and we're looking at the slides while ago of length of calving season. I mean, depending on what the producer's current calving season looks like, if if they've got reproductive inefficiency in the herd, it's really going to come out that first year where you synchronize and try to AI cattle. Uh, it's really going to become apparent which ones are the are the um the laggards as far as reproductive efficiency. So I think a huge part of it is just managing their expectations and coaching them through it because a lot of our new customers, they're just green and they don't, they don't know. They're not stupid. They're just ignorant of what all goes into it. You want to have something you want to add or, or Matt, either one. Well, yeah, I think it's definitely important. Like you guys have both said to manage expectations. Um, I think it's important to be willing to be there yourself some of the times, you know, sometimes people have never put a cedar in. sometimes they don't know how to give the correct shots or, you know, use the correct needle length. I think there's a lot of little factors that we can also help with, you know, it's not just necessarily the person doing the AI or who's thawing the semen, you know, there's a lot of little things that go into it in the end. 
you know, it's not just a silver bullet. Yeah, I, I agree with what, what they all said. I think um, the most important is to educate them about, you know, it, it just doesn't happen that two weeks out of the year, your AI and it's, uh, you know, it starts uh, in the fall when they go through the shoot, getting a shot, um, it's cattle handling, it's nutrition, it's a complete management program. It all leads to that cow getting pregnant. And that's the most important factor in in having cattle is is uh cows getting bred and so um you know you know as a ai person you know we need to educate them to all facets of the of the of the year not just uh the ai part and so and yeah it's it's uh, managing expectations and um making sure that you know hey this is there's a there's a, a broad plan here to you know to uh achieve what we want to achieve you know and and that's to improve lots of lots of things i want to make sure as we're going through this that if people have questions from the audience please stop us at any moment so if there's anybody have a question they want to ask anybody on the panel right now before i jump into the next part here questions Okay, so the thing that I was going to ask Luke to talk a little bit about, so Luke is based really close to College Station and uh, do a lot of work with him. And, you know, one of the things, and, and Mara Benelli and I are going to try to address this today, is big differences between Boss Indicus and Boss Tires cattle. I think we all know this. Vitor showed the slide of a Nalori cow. Um, big difference when you, you look at those species, subspecies. So, Luke, can you just share a little bit about, you know, I, I constantly hear um, in the field, you know, Boss Indicus cows don't perform well. Boss Indicus cows don't do this to synchronization. Boss Indicus cows don't do this. Just talk about a little bit about maybe what, your experience has been with what you try to do with some of your Brahmin or, or heavy boss indicus clients um, to get them comfortable with using synchronization. Uh, share a little bit about the, let's say, the boss indicus story there, and, and maybe the successes that y'all had with sex semen, etc. Yes, um, and stop me if I get long winded, but um, so the, you know the the Brahmin industry in this country, it's I guess it's you can definitely different from Brazil in that. Um, the genetics were really driven probably more by show ring than, than production as compared to Brazil. Um, but because of the value of Roman Catholic country, um, you know, there, there is a lot of ET, IVF, AI being done within the Brahmin industry. Um, but just to talk a little bit about my experience, um, we've got some customers there in central Texas and, um, going back, dating back to 2017, we started uh, setting up an AI breeding, um, a good number of commercial purebred Brahmin heifers. And so, you know, we were setting up anywhere from 60 to 120 head of these Brahmin heifers at once. And, you know, these commercial Brahmin heifers, these producers buy them as wing calves uh, and they raise them on grass down at the valley. And then as they get closer to being breeding age, they'll move them up to the uh, uh, Navasota Hempstead area, kind of get them ready. And then we would set a bump and breed them. And so when we first started in, in 2017, um, there's a lot of exper experimentation and uh, um, it's been a process, but we, we kind of started with a couple of different protocols. Um, I had, when these guys came to me, um, I didn't have a ton of experience with Brahmin cattle at that point, at least purebred Brahmin cattle. And so I'd I dove into the research and published literature about uh, what protocols work best, how those cattle uh, respond or don't respond to the, our traditional hormones that we use. And there's a lot of differences there, like Dr. Perler alludes to. Um, typically more sensitive to progesterone. Uh, they don't respond uh, the same as Boss Taurus cow do to um, GNRH and, and some of those things. And there's a lot of challenges there. And so we did a lot of experimentation in, in the early days. Um, you know, we were getting uh, in a 35% range on pregnancy rates. They used purely sex semen on Brahmin bulls. Uh, so they were just wanting to produce uh, commercial purebred Brahmin replacement females. And so that's what we were doing. And um, little by little, we, we kind of tweaked different things throughout the process. But the, the biggest three we uh, we would ultrasound these cattle 30 or 60 days post AI. And what we were finding is that even though those cattle looked relatively uniform, they were big, they were fleshy, they looked mature enough, the maturity on those cattle was all over the board. 
on those heifers. Um, and it's, in my experience, it's a lot more drastic than Boston horse cattle. Um, like I said, those cattle were fairly uniform visually, but once you got in there and looked at the reproductive tracks, they're just all over the place. So we made the decision that um, on day zero, regardless of what protocol we used, we were going to ultrasound those heifers and we're basically going to eliminate the ones that were not mature yet. And that made a huge difference. Um, and so going forward, basically what, what we've been using is, uh, uh, I refer to it as B-type on the protocol feed, it's called something different, but um, it's it's a protocol designed specifically for boss bossinicus influence cattle. Um, and basically, what it is is a prostaglandin on day zero, and then you put a cedar in for five days. At the end of five days, you pull that cedar and give another shot of prostaglandin. So the reasoning behind that is um, at least the literature cites that. Brahmin cattle, Bosonicus cattle are more sensitive to progesterone. So you give that prostaglandin shot on day zero to re uh, remove any CL. So the only source of progesterone from coming from that cedar. Um, there's also the, obviously the shorter duration of the, of the cedar, just a five day. So we took that synchronization protocol and we um, implemented a split time AI. And um, we had AI times of 66 hours and 90 hours after cedar removal and that second prostaglandin shot. And the reason, in, in my experience and in my capacity with ST genetics and using a lot of sex semen, the reason why I'm a huge fan of split time AI um, is in the early days, sex semen was, was pretty terrible. Um, the fertility was really bad. It was really expensive. Um, and there was two big problems. Basically, we were really stressing and, and beating up and uh, degrading that semen throughout the sorting process. And then we also were using up some of the finite energy of those sperm cells during the sorting process. And um, in recent years, about 2015, 2016, we fixed, we fixed the first problem, which greatly increased the fertility. But I would say in layman's terms, the biggest limiting factor today with sex semen is compared to conventional semen, it doesn't last as long in, in the reproductive tract. So we've, we've got a narrower window of opportunity there. And so to me, what split time uh, AI achieves is, you know, again, talking about bell-shaped curve, we've talked about that a couple of times already this morning. Anytime you synchronize a set of cattle, um, you're going to have that bell-shaped curve. And you're going to have some cattle that come into heat and respond earlier and some cattle that come into heat and respond later. And what um, split time AI does particularly well uh, semen is it, it gives more, more precise timing of semen delivery relative to that animal and when and when she's going to ovulate and so when we when we went to that in conjunction with a b-sync type 2 uh, designed specifically for bosinicus cattle uh, we started seeing improvements along with ultra and, and eliminating those immature heifers from the onset and so our pregnancy rates started going from you know 35 percent to 40s to 50s and um ironically one of our most successful projects we did on about a third head of these uh commercial brahmin heifers we did in this in the early spring of 2021 so we bred those cattle in january uh using that protocol they went through that terrible freeze that we had in february at around day 30 after ai which uh i thought was going to be uh, a train wreck and just smoke us. Um, but we came back and we ultrasounded those heifers 66 days later and we got, we had 60% pregnancy rate on that group uh, using that split time protocol. And, um, you know, just speaking to some of the differences in the, in the Brahmin cow, the Bosinicus, over all of those projects that we did, um, we probably average about a 35% heat response rate um, overall, which you know, it sounds extremely low, um, but those cattle, they just, they don't express uh, heat the same as Bostorus cattle do. Um, we breed, even though we utilize the heat patches as a good kind of visual tool and an indicator of heat response, we still breed a lot of gray patches based off of secondary signs such as mucus or uh, cervical tone or things like that. Um, because they just don't show heat the same way that English cattle do. And so there's a lot of nuance when you're setting up and breeding those Brahmin cattle. 
Um, disposition on those cattle is a huge deal. Those particular heifers that they that we work with, I mean, they don't see very many people before they bring them to us. So, you know, I've told those guys, I said, hey, if y'all can work with them for a month or two, you know, before we set them up, you know, we'd probably get five, 10, maybe 15% better rates just from the standpoint that they're they're just so jacked up when they come to the shoot because they're wild. Um, but there's those are just some of the challenges that we have worked through and faced. Um, and and there are a lot of differences. There's a lot more nuance when you go to breed those cattle. Um, it's not as simple as just looking at the patch and breeding or not breeding. You got to look for those secondary signs. Um, but um, that's kind of what we've done in a nutshell. Um, and on those Brahman heifers, if, if we can hit 50%, I'm super happy because there's like, so there's just so many challenges there. So if, if we can hit around 50% and that's kind of where we average, uh, sometimes we're better than that. Like I said, the best group we've had was that 60%, um, but typically we're around 50, 55. And anytime we can do that, I'm super ecstatic. Um, the split time AI is obviously one more trip to the shoot for some of those cattle. And in last night's meeting, you know, there's a big discussion around um, maybe convenience or less labor in terms of trips to the shoot versus results and maybe more trips to the shoot through the shoot um and everybody's everybody's got a different perspective on that but i guess for me as we adopt more of these technologies that add value um and revenue to operations um to me that that extra day where you might have to hire a couple cowboys and maybe maybe several hundred more dollars if you look at the grand scheme of what they're getting from um implementing those reproductive management changes it's really insignificant um compared to the overall cost and what they're getting out of it so um i'm not saying that you know that b-sync type 2 split time ai i'm not saying that's uh the right thing to do or that's the only way to do it that i'm just i'm just sharing my experience and kind of what we've done and what we've seen um and we we're always trying to do better on those brahmin cattle and figure out you know all the nuances and how they're different how to improve so Yep. So I'll just um, stop you there, Luke. I think one of the things, you know, that you, you had when we first talked about that project many years ago, um, we were very concerned about a lot of factors, but you had, you guys had a plan you put in place to corrective action to increase pregnancy rates. And I think that's really important um, and, and obviously has been fruitful for you all of you as you've made those changes. And Maya and I are going to do a lot to discuss today, the differences between Boss Syndicus and Boss Taurus. And, and, as we're running out of time here, I want to ask a, a couple more questions uh, to the rest of the panel. So, you know, and, and for really for any any of you three, um, what's so if you go into a a small to medium sized herd, let's say anywhere from thirty to seventy five cows, all right? So, what's your strategy um, to make a herd like that successful? Okay, let's say they they've had a natural service breeding season. Um, it's been somewhat decent records uh you get in there you know what's a strategy that you utilize that's been successful um i I'm, i've used to work with you a lot dan when we were in missouri I, I saw your strategy sort of work and and i guess you know how do you act as as sort of a reproductive specialist but also provide advice on vaccines nutrition sort of the whole shebang right because they're going to ask you all these questions so what's your strategy when you get there for any of y'all in a small to medium-sized herd to get a producer started? I guess I'll start. Um, you know, it's a, you know, I guess it's pretty easy for me. I mean, the the 50 to 75 head herd, you know, it's not a huge herd, but, you know, that's an easy size herd to what I would say max out. Um, hey, let's, uh, you know, first by AI and we're going to, you know, first thing we want to do is add quality to add value and three we're trying to create a story to do both the first two um so so to start you know it's uh once again it's just about educating them management so forth how do we be successful in this project um you know at that size of herd to me that's a uh, you know fairly easy and simple to do for any kind of family operation um you know once you get in that mindset of hey this is what we're going to do and make this practice year after year it just comes a way of life in my opinion so um i guess that's how i would go at it i guess from my point of view i'd want to know you know when 
when the animals have calved so that we can try and figure out when's the best time to start our estrus synchronization protocol. I'd want to know a little bit about their vaccination schedule, you know, how, how long before their breeding season have these animals been vaccinated? Um, what, is, what do they look like? What's their body condition score look like? They should be at a pretty decent body condition score if we're trying to get them pregnant, right? So there's a lot of these little things that I want to make sure are going well so that we can get the best possible pregnancy rates in the end. Um, it's also important for them to have adequate facilities. A lot of the time, smaller herds don't necessarily have the best facilities. So, you know, if we need to bring a portable chute to their facilities to help them out, things like that, we, we need to consider as well. So, I mean, I'll add on to that. Facilities probably is one of the biggest deciding factors of, you know, if I'm going to go into a place and offer my service of breeding those cows, having the facilities to do it. Um, you know, in, in Missouri, we've got the Show Me Select Heifer Program, which is a basically a whole herd management from a vaccination program. And a lot of my pr producers kind of follow that vaccination regimen. They visit with their local vets, make sure they're on track with that. Um, and also in Missouri, I work with a lot of people that do, it's a diversified operation. They're doing row crops, they're doing cattle, they're doing a lot of other things. So a lot of these timed AI programs work really well because we as an AI company can come in on one day and inseminate all of your cows. They know that on Thursday morning, we're going to be breeding cows. So they got to shut the planter down for that day. I mean, so the, so you can schedule a lot of these things and get them accomplished with time AI programs. Yes, you can also use heat detection and breed over a couple of days. It's, it, it, it depends what works for that individual um, and that operation. And it's, uh, you know, my suggestion would be to visit with your AI rep and tell him what your situation is, him or her, what your situation is, and let them kind of work with you to figure out what the best program for your operation is, because it may be different than what your neighbor's doing as well. Questions from the audience. I have a question for the uh, uh, realm of heifer management. Are those yearly heifers or those two year old heifers? Yeah, on those cattle, I never knew the ages. I'm not sure they knew the ages. <laughs> um, if I had to guess, they they probably range from 16 to 24 months. Um, but yeah, I, ne I never actually knew the ages of those cattle. And that was another reason why we went to ultrasounding everything on day zero of the protocol, because that just that just made it easy right there. We never wasted any money on additional drugs or cedars if they weren't ready. We just they would they would kick them out and, you know, maybe develop them a little bit longer and, and do them the next breeding season. So. But like I said, in, in my experience, compared to Boss Taurus cattle, they you cannot judge whatsoever i mean they we would have big stout fleshy vomit heifers come to the shoot that would have itty bitty little ovaries and then you'd have you know a little dink come through that you'd say you know oh, there's no way she's ready and she'd be cycling so they're just all over the place and so that's why we started ultrasound and everything just to eliminate that variable go ahead i have one comment question Yes, so that we don't see until they get ready to do it. They make them good then. If they didn't carry the shape, they're doing it. Absolutely. I'm just going to repeat the comment online so everyone can hear. The comment is, you know, it, the important thing is condition at the time of calving, right? We all know how difficult it is to put condition on cows post calving. So pre planning and obviously herds that you have continual years of experience with, you you know when you show up that it, success in those herds is really driven by pre calving management and and post calving management coming into an AI program. So uh, I want to end with this, and I'm going to ask each of you um, to tell the audience what you think is your number one key to success with the programs that you work with. So if you had to boil it down, if it's standing on one foot with two hands in the air, or if it's, you know, praying or whatever it is, what's your major key to success in the programs that you work with, or Lauren, in your case, in your own personal program that you could pass off to 
everybody in the room and, and joining us online, that this is what makes you and your repro programs that you work with successful. Did you break it? Yeah, I think just managing expectations like we've already been saying, but having patience, um, I think if the producers also have patience with themselves while they're learning how to do all this stuff, I think that's very important. I think, you know, trying to check as many boxes as possible. There's a lot of things you've got to take into account. You know, it's not just one thing that's, sometimes it's one thing, but if you're trying to do everything as best as you possibly can, I honestly think that just trying to do everything the best you can is the key to success. You know, give your shots in the right place, do them at the right time, AI at the right time, just make sure you're doing everything by the, you know, when you're supposed to do it. I think if you can manage as many of those little factors as possible, I think, I think that's the best way to get you know, really good pregnancy success. Matt? I guess, uh, you know, in the complete AI program, you know, the main goal in my my mind is, is how do we add value? How do we improve quality? Um, you know, that is the end result that I think uh, you add value, you're going to be successful. And it doesn't matter if it's just an AI program or if it's a synchronization program. At the end, we're all adding value. Um, you know, one thing, you know, we talk about carcass weights. We talk about carcass this and that. One thing not to forget is don't forget about what the genetics you're adding to your herd and that mama cow and what, what that value is. And by doing all this, we hope you know that improves as well so uh, you know it's all about creating a story to help us market or to uh, have a better endpoint on the rail so um anyway i guess that's would be um, my biggest um success so for us being a producer it's i guess three things come to mind it's setting goals and then how are we going to achieve those goals by managing and measuring them? We always say you can't manage what you don't measure at our house. And then our third deal is talk communication with other breeders, whether they're different breeds or peers out there. For me, it's looking at some around the room. we got some guys we've collected semen with, put up embryos with, transferred embryos, talk to those people, understand the success stories, but Really, when you start hearing some, I guess, the bad things, the horror stories, take what you can from that and learn from that to avoid that. That's always been my biggest deal is I want to hear failures and how I can avoid that from happening for me or my customers and clients. Because if I can do that, we're probably on the road to success from the start. And it just makes it a better experience all the way around for us. I'll go ahead and jump in. I mean, I, I would probably say just your support system, rely on your AI reps, rely on your university professionals, rely on to your university extension professionals. I mean, if, if you have issues, call and ask email. I mean, that's, that's what we're here for. And that's, you know, to rely on those people out there, that's going to help you through the wins and help you through the struggles too. For me, for me the most obvious thing is just good uh, year round management, but a big thing for me is reducing as many variables as you can. Um, probably one of the most frustrating things for me and some producers is, um, you know, from year to year, they're changing so many things that you can't, you can't compare year to year because, you know, you know, this year we fed this getting ready for breeding season. Uh, now we're feeding something different. Now we're trying a different protocol. You know, they're always changing things, but when you change several things at once, you can't compare it to last year um, and have a true comparison. And so like in the case of those, those Brahmin cattle, we tweaked, we tweaked what we were doing every year, but we tried to just change one thing at a time so we could uh, objectively tell what was actually making a difference and try to reduce as many variables. And um, same thing with ET work, you know, somebody will, have three good flushes or aspirations with one person and then they have a bad one and they're like, ah, oh, you know, I'm going to go down the road to this other embryologist, you know, and, and, uh, and they, they don't take into account all the different variables that are contributing to the success or failure. And they're just adding more variables. So 
Yeah, and I, I think it's it's hard for us as humans, right, to acknowledge when we did something wrong. And, you know, sometimes we do things wrong. We make poor management decisions. And, and I think also recognizing that and, and how do we correct that. Uh, one thing that I'll highlight before we close this session is that at BeFreePro.org, we have an Ask the Expert tab. And Vitor and Sandy can test to this that we get all kind of questions there. I mean, everything that you can imagine. Um, so feel free to use that, all right? And, and um, there's a number of us that respond to those. We try to address them as quick as we can. Utilize that, utilize all these folks to answer questions um, as, as a support system to get through. Um, it, the successes are easy because that's the fun part, right? It's the challenges that we, that we address, you know, all the situations that come up throughout these programs um, that we're all there uh, to help you with. So let's thank the panel real quick for their... So just before we close this, um, we have a number of great sponsors for this meeting. Without the sponsorship, this would not be possible. Um, they're rotating on the screen, and, and the sponsors also deserve a round of applause. They've been longtime supporters. So I encourage you to visit their booths outside. I encourage you to visit with them um, about what they're doing. Also, we have the posters set up around the room, visit with the students, ask the students questions, uh, figure out what they're working on, how it might advance your herds, et cetera. And then lastly, um, we're gonna take a break. We're, we're scheduled to start back about 10, 15. We're gonna split into these two rooms, okay? So um, Mario Benelli and I are gonna be in here. We're gonna cover estrus synchronization in a more advanced way this morning. And then in the afternoon, we'll be in the other room. We're going to cover estrus synchronization from the basis up. Okay, so basically, like you know, just from uh, not knowing anything. And there's absolutely no judgment whatsoever on what room you go to. All right. In fact, a lot of us could probably go to the beginner one for some retraining to at some point. So you're going to get the same basis. We're just going to be more advanced this morning, and then talk about the basics and and end up at the advanced stage this afternoon. So 10:15. We'll be back in those rooms, visit with the students, visit with uh, the sponsors. The drilling is commenced, is going to cease at some point today. It's a structural situation that they can't stop, which is great. We probably don't want them to stop at this point, but that's going to that's going to stop at some point. OK, so we appreciate everyone's patience with that. All right. Thank you.